Jeremiah. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a show I've been wanting to get on for a while, so yeah. I'm glad it's finally happening. I'm glad too, and I, it's always better when we can talk in person. Absolutely. That's always the best kind of conversations. And for you, as I was talking about before the interview off air, you are what they would say is a journeyman in some ways, you, you know, but I also think that you're not the outlier in this situation. I think there's more NFL stories of guys like you than there are the guys who played 15 years with the same team and, you know, threw for thousands and thousands of yards. I think the NFL player story, if you were just to kind of average it out, it's probably more along the lines of yours. And that's why I think it's important to tell that story here today. Uh, let's start with now, though. You just recently signed a new contract with the Bills. Yep. So you're back uh, in Buffalo. And I asked you off air, what does that mean? And you said it means a chance, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone's like, oh, man, congratulations. You signed for 2019. Like, you're ready. You're set. You're all go. And I was like, hmm. I just means that I'm on the 90 man roster with a chance to make the 53 in September. Yeah. And that's what I've learned this league is. Uh, this league is a lot of opportunity. This league is a lot of when you get an opportunity, you better make the most of it because you have no idea when the next one might come. Right. And it's just something that I'm excited to not have to do free agency again this year because that is extremely stressful and not something I was looking forward to doing. And to be back with the Buffalo Bills who gave me a shot last year after I pulled my hamstring in Carolina and sign me week three to give my chance to go back with them and show them what I can do through an off season and help the team and the organization is something I'm really excited about. How are those Buffalo fans? They're awesome. the time you've been they're, there? They're everything you, you think they are. Yeah. Um, I remember my first home game, I was pulling out of the facility on Friday afternoon after practice and the parking lots were like kind of full. And I asked one of the guys like, what's going on? They're like, Oh no, the parking lots open Friday afternoon and the RVs show up and they for stay a Sunday game? for a Sunday game and they stay until <laughs> like Monday morning. Like wow. they don't, they don't leave and yeah. they just pro progressively get bigger and more full. And it, Bill's mafia is everything it was cracked up to be. That's awesome. Jeremiah share. I think it's interesting for the listener from the time you finished your college career and you, you were undrafted out of Nebraska, mm -hmm. the transactions that have taken place as you've gone. Now this is five years ago, basically. Yeah. So in the past five years, share, where you got your start in the NFL and where it's taking you now to Buffalo. I think people will be fascinated to hear that. Yeah, so I almost actually, I'll back up a little bit. I almost left after my junior year uh, at Nebraska. I put in for where I would go and I was projected a third through fifth round pick. Okay. And I was like, you know what? I want to come back. I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to finish school because I honor that commitment and then I'm going to try again. Uh, week seven of my senior year, I partially tear my MCL in my left knee. I battle through it. I don't miss any time, but I don't play great. And I end up not even getting invited to the NFL Combine. Mm. And that one stung. That, that one hurt. But again, I just was like, you know what? This is my dream. Uh, my girlfriend, now wife at the time, was like, you know what? You got to do everything you can to chase this dream. So I trained. I went through pro day the whole bit. Again, went undrafted to the Chargers. And that was my first taste of, okay, I get a chance. Mm. And so I went through camp and we were going through and I'm making the practice squad there, which for me was like, okay, just foot in the door again. Just keep grinding. Mm. And throughout the year, we had injuries that happened. Guys went down all over the place. And I finally got a chance. Week 12, I got activated the, to the 53-man roster and ended up on Saturday night against the 49ers. I'll never forget it. I got to get my first live action. Our guard tear, uh, broke his arm right before halftime. Oh. And I had to go in the second half. And we were down uh, 21 points. And we led the largest comeback in Chargers history and won the game. And it was just such a jubilation of like all my hard work had come to that moment for that year. And to see that that was something that I could do. It's like, I can play with these guys. That was my first like notion of like, no, I can play in this league. Because you, you always have it. that little bit of doubt. Like, sure. will I be able to play? Am I good enough? Is this something that I'll be able to make a living off of? And so end up starting the week 17 against Kansas City. We, we had to win to go to the playoffs. We didn't make it. So the next year I come into camp feeling pretty good about myself. Like, all right, you know, I, I played well. I should be able to give myself a good chance here. And my wife, who was working in Kansas City at the time, is originally from Southern California. So she's like, she quit her job. She moved back to live with her parents. And we were engaged at this point. And she was like, I'm going to work from home and I'll be able to see, I'll work from, uh, I'll be able to work and live at home and we'll be able to see each other on the weekends. I'll come down for games. And Tuesday, we had this great grand plan. Yeah. Go through camp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure you can see we know where this is going. Is going. Yeah. So go through camp. I'm, I'm in the two deep. I'm, I'm getting reps with the ones and the twos. It's looking like I'm going to make the team possibly even compete for a starting spot. Cut time comes around and the 10 minutes before the cut deadline, my wife and I are sitting in the hotel room and I'm going, okay, there's three options. I make the team. Yeah. I get cut. I get put up back on practice squad. 
Like those are the three things. Phone rings and uh, I answer the phone. It's the GM, Tom Telesco. Hey, it's Tom Telesco. How you doing? I think I'm all right. He's like, well, we just want to let you know that we traded you to the Minnesota Vikings. Thanks for everything that you've done. If you could bring your playbook in and everything, uh, your flight leaves tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Whoa. Okay. And so, that's not Southern no, California. No, that's not Southern way. California yeah, at all. Minnesota and, is not. And Emma had just <laughs> taken a job up there. And so it's just this whole whirlwind of my first real experience of the transactions that take place in the NFL. Mm. And so flight left 6 a.m. the next morning, got into Minnesota, and my wife and I did the distance thing again for another year. This is now two years of doing distance, and we were going to get married that next offseason. And so went to Minnesota, and it was tough. I walked into a room that had been established. I walked into a room that guys have been through all of OTAs, all of camp together, and then yeah. here comes this guy that people viewed as a threat. Mm -hmm. Some guys, the older guys were like, okay, just a big guy. But all the guys that weren't starters were like, this guy is a threat to me. He, yeah. he is a threat to my job. He is a threat to everything. And that was my first kind of experience with, okay, this is a real like cutthroat business. Someone got cut in order for me to come here. And I took someone's place that I didn't even know. And I'm immediately looked at as that guy that just replaced the guy with no one, no context behind it. Yeah. So I, I ended up playing three years there. Uh, 2016, I start 10 games for him at right tackle and left guard. In 2017, I end up starting uh, eight games for him at left guard and right tackle. Uh, NFC Championship run, great run. Yeah. And then uh, they end up telling me that they're not going to pick up my uh, tender yeah. for 2018, which came as a surprise. So Which basically means agency. you're a free agent, yeah, right? Yeah, hit free agency, kind of not real sure it was going to happen. End up signing with Carolina. I uh, was ro rolling with them there. Again, we had some injuries and opportunity to present itself in the third preseason game, which is like the dress rehearsal, as everyone talks about. I start form at right guard against the Patriots. And we get 10 plays into the game, and I pull my hamstring. Mm. And that was my first moment where I was like, man, is this is this it? Like, I battled to get to where I am. I fought, and I've never not been on a day one team uh yeah. roster and so i was thinking okay maybe maybe i'll stick around maybe they won't cut me and like let me rehab and sure enough uh they grab me again on the last day and say hey we're gonna give you an injury settlement uh for three weeks and then if you're still on the street out six weeks we can bring you back so i'm thinking man i'm gonna be i'm gonna be at home for six weeks like mm. that is crazy and so i just got in my car that day i'll never forget and just drove 18 hours straight back to nebraska just very lost very confused and just kind of very sad mm. and then three weeks later the buffalo bills call and say hey we want to work him out if he's healthy we want to sign him and i got a chance to go up there and work out and put my best foot forward and they liked what they saw at least i think they did so we signed and then yeah. just extended so it's, it's been a whirlwind man uh here there and everywhere but again just going into year six just fighting for another chance there's so much there to to unpack i think because i'm just thinking like if if i had a job that was like that my wife would probably murder me like i really don't <laughs> think she would accept this at all, right. all. um Let's start with that aspect of yeah. having a girlfriend, fiance, now wife. How important was it for her to kind of be on board with this, you know, next how many years it's going to be whirlwind that you're on? You know, because you obviously you would like to sign with one team and Absolutely. play the rest of your career. Right. Who wouldn't? Um, but that's not the case and that's not what happened to you. So what is it about her being there to support you? How important was that? Yeah. I mean, she's my rock. Uh, yeah. she always has been, I mean, even through college, we, we will do, we were together nine years this past December. We've been married. It'll be three years tomorrow, actually. Mm, great. Um, so it's just one of those things that if without her, I wouldn't be where I was. And she knows that. And I know that, but it, it didn't come easy. Um, it's one of those things that every year is a different growing experience. Every year is something new. And growing through it together. And I can remember we did distance my first two years in the league. And that was tough. Yeah, um, That was really hard. We did a two-year engagement. We were engaged my first two years. And we did all our, all our marriage counseling over the phone. And it was it was really hard. But once we got married, we both decided, like, no more distance. Even if that means you have to quit your job or whatever it is. Like, we're doing this together. And yeah, we'll figure it out. And we'll figure it out from there. Yeah. And that first year together was a huge adjustment period. Um, because I had gotten to my routine of what season looked like. And... She had never really been in with me during a season. She never really experienced that. I came home and had a terrible day at practice, so I'm just in a bad mood. Yeah. And now I'm portraying my bad mood onto her bad mood. And it, it took that that first year was tough as far as trying to learn how to how to coexist during football season. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's really important for young couples going into the NFL is it's going to be really hard that first year because you are so in depth and enamored with what is football season. 
that while it's still really tough, you have to find time for each other. Yeah. You have to make sure that you're filling each other's cups because if you're not good at home, it spills over into the workplace. And that's with any profession. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's so much more in this job with all the things that come, come and go with the job. I mean, the security, the ups, the downs, the pitfalls, the whole bit that if you're not solid at home, it's really hard to be good at work. I want to unpack a little bit the uh, so second time I've used the word unpack, by the way. I don't I like usually it. use it. It's a solid word. Is it a good word like for the it. podcast? I'm in for right. it. I'm in on Thank it. you, Jeremiah. Um, I want to look back at the moment you said you got cut, the injury settlement when you were with Carolina, mm -hmm. probably going through an entire OTA, offseason, training camp, preseason games, thinking you're good, a little torn. Did you say you tore your, your, your hamstring? hamstring. Yeah. Not tore it, pulled, pulled it. it. Because a tear is a different Very different awesome. animal. You you pull a hamstring, suddenly there's an injury settlement, and you're not with a job anymore yeah. or without a job. But you said you drove 16 hours back to Nebraska. Take me through that. And I want to hear your faith testimony in a minute, but take me yeah. through the, the sort of mindset as a football player, as a man of faith, as a husband, all of that as you're driving back 16 hours and what that – was like you just feeling like you don't even belong. You, just, you don't really know what to feel. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was the first time I had been cut. Mm. Honestly, I mean, I, my first year I got cut and put on practice squad, but the whole time was like, "Hey, you're not going anywhere. Like you're going on our practice squad." Yeah. Like the only thing that could happen is someone would have picked me up on their active, which would have been awesome, but didn't yeah. happen. Right. And so this was the truly first time. Like, hey, you need to get your stuff and and go. And my wife had left three days earlier because her whole plan, again, our whole grand scheme plan was she was going to go fly home, pack everything up, pack the dog up, pack our life up, and then drive out to Carolina. And we were going to move into a place. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I know, I'm calling her going, well, don't leave. Um, I'm coming to you. And yeah, I mean, I was supposed to break it up into two days and I was just so angry, sad, confused. It was just this whole range of emotions of what am I going to do now? And that doubt, again, like I kind of talked about as a rookie, can I play with these guys? It started creeping back in my mind, like, can I still stay in this league? Yeah. And I'll never forget driving home is just, I think it was somewhere in the middle of Kansas that I, I was just like, is again, the whole kind of worthless feeling. And I never want to feel that again. And I got to kind of rely back on my faith with that, that my identity is not in football. Yeah. My identity is in so much more that football is just a platform to really bring out who my true identity is. And so I drive home it was really eye opening and it was a lot. And my wife, again, was just so supportive through the whole thing of just you know, like we will be OK. Even if I didn't believe it, she she made sure that I believed it. Yeah. And it's important through her and through faith, it was able to we were OK and God provided. And we're sitting here today because of that grace and that opportunities that he's provided for us. And God always opens up another door, whatever it is. If, if you know, we're faithful, we stay faithful. He does. And he opened up that door for you in Buffalo. Jeremiah Searles is our guest here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Let's learn about your testimony. Mm -hmm. we, we pretty much ask any first-time guests on this podcast what their testimony is. I think it's an important story for everybody to be able to tell. Uh, so what's your story? So my story starts back of when I was a little boy. I was born, uh, my family was Catholic, so I was baptized Catholic. There's still the pictures of, I think I'm probably about a week old. Mm -hmm. um, went to Sunday school every Sunday, learned the stories through pictures and veggie tales and the whole bit and I love veggie tales. Oh, they're the best. <laughs> and so, uh, as we got into high school, my family and I, we, we had some, we had some troubles. Uh, we had some issues and our church kind of pulled away from us as much as we pulled away from it. And for me, that was the moment that I then put God and Jesus and church in the same box, that they were the same to me. You can't have one without the other. You right. can't go to church and know Jesus and you can't know Jesus and not go to church. And so I put them all in the same box and I kind of just walked away from it. Uh, towards the end of high school, I was like, you know, what? I don't really want, I don't, I don't need that. I know God. I have my own relationship with God. And that was my thing. And then in college, I tried to force myself back into a little bit. I remember one year for Lent, I was like, you know, I'm going to go to church every Sunday. And I went and I was like, man, they changed a lot of the words since the last time I'd been in here. We kneel, stand, kneel, stand with your spirit or whatever it was. And yeah. then um, when me and my wife started getting serious about getting engaged, we had the talk as far as like, well, you're Catholic because I still identified as Catholic. And she's like, I'm a Christian. Like, what are we going to do? 
And what's and the difference too, right? Like, what's the difference? Yeah. Like, and I was like, and I, for whatever reason, I was just stubborn. I was like, well, you'll have to convert. And so she went to church with me a few times and she was like, I don't, I don't know if I want to convert. Like, is this a deal breaker? And right around then is when actually my parents got called to another church in Colorado, Red Rocks Church out there. They're a huge group and they're a Christian based church. Mm. And it was kind of cool because I remember I went home and I went to church with them a few times. And my best friend at the time, uh, his name's Spencer, he had not been a believer. And I actually got to watch him get baptized one time. I just went home for Christmas break or something. And it was at that moment that I was like, okay, you know what? I can, I can be a Christian. I can have this relationship. But even then it was like just the saying I'm a Christian. Sounded good. Sounded great. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, like I can identify with I love God again. And yeah. I don't have to go to church and kneel and sit and stand and kneel and sit and stand. And sure. I can just kind of do my own thing. And so go through college still just calling myself a believer in God, but not truly giving my life to God. And it wasn't until last year that through Case Keenum and through the Minnesota Vikings that our Bible study, that there's a conference that we can come to and we can learn more about God and who we want to be. And I was kind of like, "Eh, I'm good. Like I know God. And my wife just kept telling me like, Jeremiah, there's something I want more. I'm feeling like I'm being called to more. And I took that as a personal attack on me. I took that as a, what, I'm not enough for you. Like what I do is not enough for us. Like what I put myself through and I, 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 what I do, what I do. And she kept saying, it's not about you. Yeah. It, I, yes. What you do is for us is incredible. What you do for us is great, but it's not about you. God is calling me to more. Hmm. And so I reluctantly agreed to come down to the conference and I was like, you know what? I'll come down. I don't want to be here. And honestly, my wife and I fought the whole way here. Hmm. Um, cause I was still couldn't get over the fact of what do you mean you need more? I mean, literally pulling up to the, the, the conference last year, we both had tears in our eyes. Cause we just, we drove from, uh, where we were at and we just were crying the whole time fighting with each other. And so it started off real good, I but, guess uh, so. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> when we got here, the first speaker, it felt like the entire weekend from, from start to finish, God was just speaking directly into my heart. Hmm. And I, I could never, my wife kept asking me like, why can't you just feel like they're soften your heart? Let your heart be more. What are you being called to? And I'll never forget, uh, Carl Lentz, uh, he got done speaking and I just felt like he literally spoke to me the entire time and there was no one else in the entire room. Mm. And so the next day I was just talking to Emma and I was like, I just need to talk to him. Like, I don't know why, I don't know what it is, but like God is calling me to talk to Carl. And so I grabbed him and I was like, do you got a second? And I just kind of laid my whole story up to that point out of what had happened and how things had kind of turned. And and he was the first person that really told me, I'll never forget, he took a piece of paper and he wrote church on one side, God on the other side. And he drew a big circle around and he ripped it in half and goes, they're not the same. Wow. They're, They're not the same. And visually for me, that was such a, a moment of clarity that you don't have to, cause I couldn't let go of what had happened in high school as far as like without one, there is not the other. Yeah. And that moment of clarity. And that day I, I said the prayer with Carl right there and I was saved February 22nd, 2018. Uh, 18. 18 yeah. And at that moment since then has been nothing but growth and just continuing to work. And we're coming up on a year of me getting baptized. My wife and I got baptized later that day together. Case to baptize Case, you, right? Case was Case here Keenum. at the conference and he's actually the one that dunked me in the water and he needed a little help to get me out, but yeah. he got me out. The quarterback dunking yeah. an offensive line. Right, it's right. not easy. And, and ever since then, it's been all about just growth and learning and doing it together with my wife, which is the coolest part. And there's been times where seasons of this in this past year of where life's been good and I've leaned away from it and life's been hard and I've leaned really hard on it. Yeah. And I am just looking to continue. One of the reasons that we have this conference every year is kind of my, like a reset, like for the year, like regroup, kind of refocus mm-hmm. and try and make sure that you were better than the year before, which is all you can ask. Yep. And so that's kind of my story as far as come to faith, continuing with faith. And just, it, it's so important because then it reaches back to like I was talking about my identity is not in football. Yeah. I always tell people my identity is I'm a brother of Christ who gets the opportunity to play football. Yeah. And that's kind of what I've relied on for the past year as far as just how I want to live my life. Yeah. You're not a football player having a Christian experience. You're a Christian having an athletic experience. Absolutely. Which is, it's so refreshing when you hear things like that because so many guys you see on ESPN or whatever just 
that once football is over, they have nothing. Yeah. Because their identity is so much engulfed in, I am a football player and I am nothing else. That when you realize that you are not just a football player, you are so much more. There's so much more that you can do with that because you have that security in yourself, not just relying on something else to tell you who you are. Does it help being in in sense, I don't like using the word journeyman because it's a label, but does it help having been a guy who's kind of experienced the gamut of an NFL player in having this faith and trust in in Jesus instead of in personnel or teammates or GMs or front office guys because of the fact that you bounced around and gotten released and gotten yep. trade and signed and then injured or like all of that to help kind of knowing it, where your faith lies? It does because at the end of the day, you never have to worry about what's the plan. Uh, you get to, I'll never forget something Francis Chen said last year. It stuck with me is his thoughts are not my thoughts. Right. His plan is not my plan. Everything that, like I said, our grand plan of having Emma move out there, our grand plan of she's going to drive out, it, it wasn't his plan. And it's such an easy thing to say, much harder thing to live. And my wife reminds me of that all the time. My pastor reminds me of that all the time back in Lincoln. And I ask, I pray for it all the time. It's like, God, grant me the peace to understand the things that I can control and the things that I cannot. Yeah. Because yet yeah, being bounced around like that, so much uncertainty, so much in this job is uncertainty. But having that pillar and that, that foundation of God has a plan for me and my family and just being able to fall back on that unrelying promise has been incredibly huge for me over this past year. It's been great talking to you, Jeremiah. Let's close with this. What is it's a, it's a, it's an interesting question knowing your testimony because it's so fresh. It's only mm-hmm. been twelve months. What has God taught you? What's the biggest lesson that you've learned from Him in these last twelve months? The 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 thing that God has been continuously speaking to you in your heart and shown you over these last couple of twelve months or so. So I think there's a couple things. There. I think the first thing is the power of prayer. Um, I I didn't pray a lot, and this year I made it very intentional that. I took time each day to, and I found the time. It was actually in my morning when I go sit in the hot tub to warm up in the mornings. I left my phone. I left my playbook. I left everything in my locker. And I just spent 15 minutes in the morning just praying. Hmm. And at first it was hard. Um, At first it was like, man, what am I going to pray for? But by the end of it, I found myself like, crap, it's been 15 minutes. And I still have so much left on my prayer list. And so the power of prayer. and, And one thing was that I was praying that my wife and I could have a child this year and yeah. uh, we're expecting our first in August. Congrats. And so there's just some, there's the power of prayer. I mean, I pray for my family's health and like everything. And that was one thing. And then the second thing that I really feel that's something that I have a, is the great commission. I have so many friends from college that again, like you said, I'm so fresh in my belief that I have so many friends that aren't believers yeah. And it's hard because when you get back in your friend circle, it's very easy to get pulled back into the worldly view. It's very easy to get pulled back into what the world thinks of you and wants of you. Absolutely. That the more I think about it and the more I talk to people, it is a obligation out of complete love to be able to go and testimony to these people. But the only way you can do it is if you live it. Mm-hmm. And so that's one thing this year is I want to continue to keep living like Christ, living more Christ-like so that I can maybe bring more people to his kingdom and show them the love that he has for us. Yeah, that's awesome. And imagine the the, the moment we all go into eternity and even the seeds that we plant, mm-hmm. we don't realize how they were watered or how they bloomed until we get there. And we say, oh, look at that. Yeah. It's such a cool idea and cool Absolutely. thought. Jeremiah Searles, Buffalo Bills offensive lineman. Uh, thank you. This is really good. I'm I glad. I'm it. glad you came and joined us, and uh, I loved hearing your story and your testimony. And we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much. Hope we can do it again sometime.